don't know anything. I know um, Roxanne. Yeah, yeah she texted me. She's not going to be here. But, so. um, okay. And we would not have known that there was no class last week, except Jan let us know. So if you could, yeah, I'm down the road. I mean, I you could text us or. Yeah, I, I think Ann did text everybody. I'm not sure if okay. last week. I can't send emails out. Yeah. I know email text. Yeah. Okay. text. I didn't get one. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, but, I mean, Jan, yeah, yeah, it's okay, but just, just so that you know, yeah. I think Joe was in the men's room. He's getting coffee. Oh, okay. Well, why don't we start with prayer then? Dear Lord, we do thank you for today. We thank you for this fellowship. We thank you for your living word. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for your protection and your preservation. We thank you for our pastors. And we thank you for your Lord. Lord, we just ask you to be with us today to guide this fellowship, this study, to enlighten us the things we haven't done or ways to get closer to you and your word. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We, uh, we're going to start right off with chapter 8. Um, it's not one of my strong points, the outlining and marking, but it's a good thing. In fact, I don't even bring a marker with me. So. It's proof. That's great. Great. Pretty done. Okay, so we'll start off with our key mem memory verse. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. Psalm 119, 144. The development of three basic skills will improve any method of Bible study. These skills are marking, outlining, and charting. They are the subjects of this chapter. Marking is a method of emphasizing key Bible passages. Marking makes it easy for you to locate verses on specific subjects. To mark your Bible, you underline selected verses. If you have different colors of pencils, you can color code your underlining. If you do not have colored pencils, you can use symbols in the margins by the verses. And here it suggests the following colors or codes. Red for verses which relate to salvation. Red re represents the blood of Jesus. It could also use a symbol of a cross for verses about salvation. Green is the color of growing things. Use this color to underline verses about spiritual growth. You could also use a flower to represent growth. Blue is the color of the heavens. Use this color to mark verses relating to the second coming of Jesus Christ, the new Jerusalem, and heaven. If you are using symbols, use a crown to mark the verses in the margin of your Bible. The crown represents the kingdom of heaven. Brown, a field of wheat ready to harvest, is brown in color. Jesus used the example of harvest when speaking of evangelism. Use the color brown to mark verses related to evangelism. You could also use a symbol number sign, which is a symbol standing for the word number. Use it to remind you of the great number of people who have yet to hear the gospel message. You can select additional colors to mark verses on other important subjects, purple, pink, yellow, black, etc. 
you can use additional symbols to assign the meanings. If I were adding symbols, I would probably do one for prophecy um, or one there's for laws. Or there's commands. quite a few of that in there. <laughs> I don't like to mark my Bibles. I underline very rarely will you see something highlighted in one of my Bibles. I just don't like that. I've got a revised standard version from the 1960s. And it's not all marked up. It's got some underlining in it, but they're easy to use when they're not, you know. But that's me. Outlining. <clears throat> An outline is a method of organizing study notes. It puts information in summary form to use in ministry and future study. An outline centers on a selected theme. This theme becomes the title of the outline, which usually reflects the subject of study. After identifying the subject of study, the next step is to identify main points, which tell something about the subject. Next, there will be subpoints. The prefix sub means that they come under or tell something about the main point. There are many ways to outline. You have selected, we have selected one which uses special numbers called Roman numerals for the main points. If you're not familiar with Roman numerals, it's a list provided for you for further study in the further study section of this chapter. Subpoints on the outline are shown with capital letters of the alphabet. Is there, if there are further points under these, they are shown with regular numbers. Study the following example, which summarizes how to make an outline. Okay. So the first one is a Roman numeral one. This is a Roman numeral one uh, used for the first main point. Um, the capital letter A, this is a capital letter used for the sub point. And then a regular number one, if there is another sub point relating to this, it would be marked with the number one. And if there's more, then you would keep numbering two, three, four, et cetera. Main point I have, so, main point one may have several subpoints. If so, continue down the alphabet using capital letters in order. Each one of the subpoints should relate to the main point. To present another main point, use the next Roman numeral. Subpoints follow the same pattern under every main point. As an example, we have preferred a brief outline of Romans 12, 1 to 2. First, read the verses. Joe, want to read that? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Okay, and the following page is an outline of that. Roman number one, present your body as a living sacrifice. A, be holy. B, acceptable unto God. Second main point, be not conformed to this world. A, be transformed. And one, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Roman numeral three, these steps will help us prove and find the will of God, which is A, good, B, acceptable, and C, perfect. And what I keep thinking of is when I was in probably sixth or seventh grade, they had us do book reports. And I really wish I would have gotten into that habit. But, but they were done kind of like this, very much like this. And if you had, you could have, subpoints of the subpoint sometimes. So you have your Roman numeral one, your capital A, your number one, and then maybe a small A, you know, it'd just be supportive points under the other points. But uh, okay, so that's your uh, this is a vertical chart. And the next one will be a horizontal chart. Uh, if you flip the page, you'll see the horizontal chart. 
Okay, let's see. Okay. If any man among you seem to be religious and by bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. In pure religion and undefiled before God, pure religion un undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep him uns himself unspotted from the world. Now, this is a vertical or horizontal row. You have a personal description, seems to be religious. The test is control of the tongue. The result is, well, a lack of it. He deceives himself, and his religion is vain. Unspotted from the world, visits poor, keeps self holy, undefiled before God, pure and undefiled. So, two methods of charting. One is more down and the other is spread out. If you do a time chart, you'll find that the horizontal is better. And it's a lot easier to go that way with time, have like a ruler. Um, is that the whole chapter? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's the whole chapter. <laughs> okay. So what the next page is, is a self-test and the key verse from memory. Righteous of the testimonies ever, everlasting, give me understanding and I shall live. Psalm 119, 144. That was good. Memory? That was good. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> Okay, what is wrong with the following outline structure under a title? You have Roman number one. This is the first main point. Capital A, this is a sub point relating to the main point. And B, this is the second main point. Now, what's wrong with that? Okay, the B should be uh, main point. Yeah. number two. Yes. And the main ways of drawing charts are vertical and horizontal. And marking as related to Bible study is simply underlining or highlighting. Marking is a way to emphasize key Bible passages. You underline selected verses or use symbols in the margins. And then further study is more of the, the same. James 3, 2 to 6. We can turn there. James 3, 2 to 6. Anyone care to read that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, for we all make mistakes. And if anyone makes no mistakes in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body also. If we put bits into the mouths of horses that they may obey us, we guide their whole body. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So the tongue is a little member and boasts of great things. How great is the forest that is set up paved by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is an unrighteous world among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the cycle of, of nature 
and set on fire by hell. Mm -hmm. Pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the human tongue under further study, yeah, one, if we offend not in word, we are, and then A. A is the perfect man. And then B, able to bridle the whole body. Example of the power, or two, point two, examples of the power of small things. A, a bit in the horse's mouth is used for two purposes. That they may obey us and the direct their whole body as well. And then B, would somebody like to do that one? The helm of the ship? That is verse four. For behold, the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So, verse 4, directed by a small rudder. And then C, a small fire sets a great forest aflame. Okay, anyone want to take Roman numeral three? That would be verses five to six. I'll read the verses first. I have the New American Standard, so if you're reading with the front. Yeah. Okay, so also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold how great the forest, a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. So... While we have different wording, it's going to come out the same. It's like a list of the things in those verses. Number three, the tongue is a small, is also small, but it, A, boasts great things. B, is a world of iniquity. C, defiles the entire body. And D, sets on fire the course of our life. And E, and is set on fire by hell. Okay. That's not bad. I, I haven't found a whole lot that I actually would be charting. If I were in a Bible study, but once sometimes if you get on a particular subject and you, it's a really good way to get things down on paper for yourself and what you read and because it's helpful. It's helpful to break it up into that, especially if you're trying to give a message because now you've got it. You can go down a list and boom, 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 and then get to the next thing. So it, it ends up being mostly what you it what you see is the, the importance in the verse. I mean, it separates out the different things in that verse. Yeah, it's 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 the points and sub points, and then you you get it in order and yeah. 
So you're the one that determines how many points are there. I mean, as you're reading, yeah. this, they're saying that there's going to be five to here. No, actually, it is all the points that are by. That's what all I saw. Um, but you're, you're right. There could be something else there that you might have put in, even if it was sub to a sub point. Mm. You know, there could be a little more there. Yeah. Okay. The next page has the Roman numerals. And if you're not familiar with how those work, you know, the only thing that used to mess me up is the L and the C until I finally remembered C means century. And that's 100. So yeah. then I got the L is 50. And that's, that's good. So if you ever need that, it's right there in 96. Okay, now this section, this next, if we turn to the page to chapter nine, I didn't really prepare for this, but you know, studying by the Bible by the Bible is comparing what's said in one book to another. And that's a, another way of studying, especially if, like with the Gospels, where it's often repeated in one gospel to another, sometimes worded differently, so that you... Okay. Anyone want to read a little? Okay. How far do you want me to read? Uh, start with the key verse, and then the introduction. Okay. <clears throat> Open I mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Psalms 119, 18. One of the best ways to begin Bible study is to learn what the Bible says about itself. That is the subject of this chapter. In this lesson, you will learn about the symbols of God's word and specific facts about God's word revealed in the Bible itself. In most institute courses, when we refer to scriptures, we write them out within the context of the lesson. This is done to save you time. But we have not written out the verses in this lesson for a special reason. One of the persons of this lesson is to familiarize yourself with using your Bible. So we have listed only the references. As you study the lesson, look up each reference in your Bible. If you are not familiar with the location of the books, look in the front of your Bible. Most Bibles have a table of contents which lists the page number where the book begins. When you find the page number listed for a book, you will be at chapter one of that book. Then look up the correct chapter and verse number. Or you can cheat like I do. Got my little tabs. <laughs> well, my, this one's in depth, oh, you are, but I have another one. I put tabs in it. It makes it so much quicker, you know? Although, I love when you go to open the Bible and you just kind of calculate, okay, that's Psalms, and you open it, and it's Psalms, or that exact scripture that you're looking for. Yeah. It's in, in. Okay, so that was uh, book, chapter, and verse. Um, the, source of the, the source of the word. The source of the Bible is God himself. Read Psalm 68, 11. This confirms that God is the source of the word. First Thessalonians 2.13 explains that the Bible is God's word and that, it is, that its source is not man. When Jesus spoke during his earthly ministry, he made it clear that the source of his words was God. See John 14.10 and 24 and 17.8 and 14 and 3.34. So that's all the Bible confirming what else is the same thing it says elsewhere in the Bible. The history of the word. The Bible reveals much about its own history, answering questions such as how long has the word existed and who first wrote down the words of God? Read Hebrews 11.3. 11, 11, this verse reveals that the word in which we live, the world in which we live, was framed, created, by the word of God. Read Genesis chapter 1 in your Bible, which tells a story of creation, and you will find this to be true. God literally spoke the world into existence. You can read more about this in 2 Peter 3, 
5 to 7. Hebrews 1 3 says that he continues to uphold the world and all things by the word of his power. Psalms 33 6 says that the heavens were made by the word of God. God is eternal. He has no beginning and end. Since God is inseparable from his word, he is the word. When the word has no beginning and no end, like God, his word has always existed. Read Exodus 20, 1 to 17 in your Bible. This is the first record of God inspiring a man, Moses, to write down his words. I'd like to see that. Exodus 20. Exodus 20, 1 through 17. 1 to 17. I'll start reading it. I don't know if we would need to read the whole 17, but. Uh, then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make you for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in the heaven above or on the earth beneath, or on the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, and the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for well, the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who, is, who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, I'm going to read the rest. It's just basically reading the commandments, but um, that's the first, those first verses. God spoke all these words. That is... One of the things in the very beginning of the Bible is where God spoke. And then in so many places, it says that Jesus is the word of God, the living word. God created everything. Jesus created everything. He is the living word. The word he spoke and it was created. Jesus is the word. And the power of God's word, it's his, it's his own being. It's his breath, the breath of God. When Jesus comes back, out of his mouth to come fire, and he's going to burn up those who oppose him. And, you know, the, so this whole thing with the word and the word being God. In fact, when we talked, Joe and I used to work with a lot of Muslims, and we'd take breaks, and some of the guys, some of them joined us for the breaks, and we started talking, Christianity, Muslim and you know sharing with each other and we did most of the sharing and we, we we witnessed a lot about healing and they would ask questions and one of their things was how can god have a son and or, or something i read the muslims they're against that how is it possible for god to have a son and you know i was able to explain that but when it comes to the word, the living word, the power of God's word, he is spirit. And our realm is like secondary. The flesh, the material world is secondary. You know, when we die, the flesh goes to dust and our spirits go on to be with him. So, I'm kind of running in a circle there, but I, <laughs> but you know that that living word, and that word of God, right there in the beginning of the word of God, 
is potent. There's a lot to it. When Satan rebelled, it became a legal thing. He rebelled by undermin undermining man, made in God's image, made for God's good pleasure, for fellowship with God, made like God, to be with God for his good pleasure. Satan and those that followed him were jealous because Satan was the closest to God in heaven. I know I'm getting off track with this, but this is something that's worth it. Um, Satan was close to, to God. He's called Lucifer, and he was jealous. He undermined God's purpose with man by getting man separate from God. God can't look on sin because, see, God... His mentality and the mind of God, he created everything. There is nothing that is created that wasn't created for his purpose. Therefore, anything going against his purpose is going against his creation, his purpose, his will, his plan. So nothing going against his purpose, will, or plan would he let exist. But because we are made for his good pleasure to be like him, to have fellowship with him, he didn't destroy us. He made us learn a lesson, booted us out of, out of the garden. But this plan of his, he's thoroughly figured out how to make it all work out. The first 2,000 years are known as chaos. The second 2,000 years, and each day with the Lord is like a 1,000 years. The second 2,000 years is the Jewish people, Israel. The, the, the third 2,000 years is the church age. We're at the end of that age. That's the first six days. The seventh day is the day of rest, the day of the Lord. We're, um, we're at the door. So, you know, some people may feel, uh, well, we don't know how many days or years are left, but we are there, you know. The six days have passed, and the biggest sign of that is the final regathering of Israel. That's the biggest thing pointing to the end of the church age. The final thing is dealing with Israel, the Jewish people. Now, we're there. Israel's back. They're at war. There's not much left. To be done you know i know somewhere in here it says um babylon will be destroyed babylon was never destroyed if i'm if i'm correct babylon was never destroyed it's like buried under the sand but babylon is between iraq and iran and because of what's happening now with Israel and Iran, and even though Al-Qaeda and Iraq, they run Iraq, they're between Israel and Iran. I believe that whatever happens there now, one of those countries will overrun the other. I think Iran will be overrun because I think Iran is going to get bombed. Either that or Israel because the Arab nations are not letting Israel fly through their airspace to attack Iran because they're not because they don't want Iran attacked because most of them have been threatened by Iran and there's big problems with that but they're afraid that if Iran gets attacked because they were allowed to fly over the other country's airspace then Iran may retaliate by destroying the other people's oil 
resources so that they can't sell oil just to get back at them. That's what the Arabs and Iraqis and so forth are saying, United Arab Emirates, so forth. So it's going to be interesting what plays out right now over there because we're at that time, you know. Israel has done something which it has needed to do for a long time, but is capable of doing it now, and it is doing it. It, it was the enemies that started it, initiated it, and everything that they've done has allowed Israel to keep destroying all the Houthis, the Hezbollah, the other ones, Iran itself. We know that Russia and China are allies of Iran. We know that Russia has committed to them. And whatever's going to happen, it's not far. It's right there, you know. So that's a good thing to think about. But we are at that seventh day. The church age, he's, his attention is on Israel now. Israel is rebuilt has come back together. Israel is not dividing its land. Israel is standing with the with God from their old ways. They are going to put up a temple and do the sacrifice. And it's going to take a little time because something's got to happen to the dome on the rock over there in Israel. You know, but it's all right there. It's really time to spend time with the Lord and seek his will. You know, going in prayer individually, in a prayer group, with church corporately, whatever. But prayer is the number one thing. That's the best place to be. We had an opportunity the other night to visit with a man at Walmart who lived in the neighborhood and he's Jewish and he's just not sure about this Jesus thing. So we we spoke with him. Yeah. And uh, we just pray that the Holy Spirit was going to use whatever we said to help him. He has a hungry heart. We knew we knew that. So we met a lady, we walked usually early in the morning, Joe and I, and we met a lady who was jogging. And it turns out she's like uh She's going for like a theological degree, but she mentioned that she has this Jewish friend. And I didn't think of it at the time, but now I'm carrying a thing from the classes because you got Jeff Israel's class oh. on the Jewish feasts, and you got Lisa's class on Hebrew and Sue's class on Genesis, Jesus and Genesis. So one of these things just might bring her right here, you know. So I, I think I have to print up some more because this folded up thing has been in my pocket for a while and it's the only way. Thank you. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. It might be a good thing to, to take one just so you have to give to somebody because an extra person in the class, you know, it'd be all right in any of the classes. So, well, we're doing pretty good, I think. We got to offer thing but we're past chapter eight um i just think it's so incredible to be here at this time and there are certain things with getting in the presence of the lord and his word is life and he you can engage him in his word and when you worship him, he inhabits the praises of his people. So you're doing a double. And then when you pray with him after those two things, you've not only got your mind on his word, also maybe even the words from the worship. And then when you get into prayer and the things, whatever's going on around you, you know, it all works get his easy. attention. Uh, uh, 
my first words to Bishop when after I met him and went over his house to help him with this copier or something. Um, because that's what I used to do. Um, was I want to edify the body. I want to build up believers. And I was interested in getting a men's ministry going because I've always been kind of involved with those, not leading them, but involved. And I've seen some excellent ones. Um, a lot of churches, what they do is it's not a fellowship. They might call it a men's fellowship, but a bunch of guys get together. They go sit, Breakfast. talk a few minutes, shoot the breeze for a few minutes, eat, and then they're listening to a lecture. They're listening to a message. It's not a fellowship. You know, when you sit in a table like this and you talk and you share and, you know, even if you're using a book to, to like go over a Bible study a little bit, you can still, everybody can talk. They can ask. You ask them questions. They ask questions. I've seen some remarkable Bible studies. I, there was one men's group up in Newtown, Connecticut, where we sat and we were using one of the men's books and uh, three guys in a row gave such responses and they weren't short, brief, little like read a paragraph kind of thing. They, these were responses from their personal experiences and so forth. And the three things just followed each other perfectly. It was like they had half a, half a sermon on, on those three things that they said. And it was all perfectly in line. All you needed was someone else to add a little more. And I told the pastor who was running it, he should tape it. He should tape it. Some guys might feel awkward about it, but I think it would be remarkable some of the things that come out of those. Well, anyway, we didn't get a men's group started, but, but look what's happening here. Look at all the classes. So that's great. Mm -hmm. and, and that's our bishop, Bishop Sam, who has, without him, none of this would be happening. You know, he's really done a remarkable job. And it's been a great thing for us. We've been part of the church for five and a half years to see how God has moved different people in, come out, but different people in. Uh, Pastor Melvin is the only worship team member that was on the stage when we, when we first started. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen people come in, Israel Kristen, Pastor Paul Heidi. I mean, all these, he's put all God these has put this together. Saying, he, you know, miraculous how he's put everybody together yes. to build his kingdom through food and such. And I've, I've seen churches that have, a lot of churches have like an assistant pastor or something. I've seen one church in Illinois where a retired pastor joined the church as an assistant pastor. And that's good. But when, I've only seen one church that I know of where three different ministers ended up all working in that one ministry. And this church is doing that too. So it's really great. You know, somebody who came in from the Big Box Church, because I was raised Catholic, into this church it's the first time in my life that i really understand what spirit filled means you know it's the first time that i've really understood all of the things i learned in the basics as a young catholic girl that didn't you know they were words they they just didn't they didn't fill me mm -hmm. but when we started coming to the freedom fellowship understood what it meant to feel the holy spirit you know mm -hmm. I, I understood yeah. what it to be alive in the spirit it's just it's amazing yeah it is contagious yeah it's, i was going to share this too that there's a gentleman named roger and when i first i was at the table doing the books and so i happened to be out in the front of the table and i met roger at the table and he he's from arizona and he said, I just moved here for a couple of years. And he says, I've been trying to church after church. And I said, I'm praying that God would lead me to 
come. And so I says, I think you found it. You know, the end of the watches and your rules and to the pastor said in the service and let me know what you think. We came back after church and we said, Dan, this is where the Lord wants me. He said, for everything that's on the stuff, we are. You know, with Israel, you know, with 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 the worship, with the pastors telling the truth. He says, That's what I want to hear, but you I don't want to hear a fancy song. You know. So he told me, he said, Thank, thank God that you love me too. So I thought that was so beautiful. Because people are searching, you know, for love. And uh, I appreciate our church telling the truth. And, you know, the body that we are, I feel so much love to you. You know, to love, love is a form of love. That's important. Mm -hmm. These days we're living in, we need support. It's a true family. It, really it is a true family. Yep. I always, always heard people talk about their church family, but they understand it now. They really do. It's, mm -hmm. it's not it's not empty words. When I came to this church, you know, I like the music ministry, mm -hmm. I like the preaching, but I see all the older people here. Mm -hmm. And it just made me think all these people they were they've been Christians all their lives or for a long time. A lot of them aren't. Yeah. You know. So there's work here. Oh, yeah. There's work right here. Even though it's a great church, it's got good leadership, there's things that need to be done in the church to raise people up and strengthen them. And because when it comes down to it, we have to know for ourselves. You know, and it's a personal relationship with Jesus. And you, you can't, like at a Catholic church, you know, the, the priest can't do anything for you, you know. So... Yeah, that's what they're missing. They lost churches is that personal relationship. It's always about the construction. Yeah. No, not. And I came out of a Lutheran background and I was confirmed at the age of 13, you know, and a couple years of Bible study and all. So I had a good knowledge of the word, right. but I didn't have that. But I had personal things that went on between me and the Lord. So that I could testify about, but my walk with the Lord wasn't really there. Right. You know, I mean, I considered myself a good Christian. I didn't steal. I didn't lie much. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. And so it's like, but then I came into a. I went through a period of ten years outside the church where I just wasn't going anywhere, and then I moved to Connecticut. And ended up uh, joining a church a lady invited me to, an assembly of God. And uh, that's a church that had three different leaders. There was a pastor there. And then there was another pastor who had such a big family that he had to keep, he, he had a church, but he had to keep stopping the church because he had to go back to work. He couldn't afford to, and he had too small a church to, to live off that so he finally decided to pull his little flock into this church and then there was another guy who had been a jehovah witness he had he was really an on fire jehovah witness he actually built a kingdom hall but then he came to the lord and he ended up coming into that church and he's the guy who led uh, like a tuesday night bible study so we now had these three leaders in the church, and it's what I'm talking about here. We have Sam, Paul Bagley, and, and Melvin. You know, and it's a great thing because there's a lot of experience with all three of them. You know, I mean, I don't know enough about Melvin's background. I know, you know he's been a Virginia and Tennessee and all that, but um, I'd like to know more about him, you know. But uh, when I heard Paul Bagley got ordained by Lester Summerall, he's somebody I hold I have very high esteem because he's a guy who was out there in the South Pacific dealing with the occult and witch doctors and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I've got that out of some of his books. So that's like, wow, this guy's, he would know then because he's out of his ministry. And then David Wilkerson's ministry is another, you know, with Bishop Sam. So. Yeah, we see what Bishop Sam's doing. I didn't know this about Pastor Begley 
and uh, his his work with the Indian bishop. But there's hundreds of pastors over in India related to that ministry. So that's incredible. I, I can tell you with Pastor Melvin, um, when my husband was in the hospital, when he came to the hospital and prayed with us, um, I understood in that moment what it meant to be ordained um, in the spirit. I mean, that that energy, that love that I felt pouring out of him over Jack and through me and just around that bed was like nothing I had ever, ever experienced before. And I just, every time I would pray after that, my hands would just be on fire. I mean, I, I feel it right now. The church I was talking about, that spiritual church that I went to after being away from church for 10 years, that was founded by a Bible study. And what happened is this guy's house was filled with the Shekinah glory of God, filled with smoke. They ran out of the house and they were they later went back in. But the man, his name was John, he saw the hand of God like in there. And he went up and down a block and everybody in the neighborhood ended up at his house doing Bible studies. And that's how that church started. He just creates the most amazing miracles. <laughs> and then, a well, miracle. I was 34. Happened to flip on Jimmy Swaggart one night when I was drunk. It was on, but it shut, when that was all over, I was on my knees crying like a baby in front of the TV. And with Zolan Levitt, I started watching him. He was good. Uh, Pat Robinson and Jimmy Swagger. I thought I got a pretty good education right there. Swagger like, was a great preacher. Absolutely. He was great. I mean, I, I, he's a man. He, had, he felt like all men do. And he's still preaching. Yeah, I know. But the neat thing was is that prior to that, experience he would call me late at night and talk because he didn't want to go to sleep and i we talk what and then i'd start talking about jesus and he'd go well i gotta go now <laughs> yeah but I'm prayer sorry. prayer I was, just, I was just i was an alcoholic on beer i didn't i mean i could do my job i didn't drink during the day but as soon as work was over i worked second shift three to eleven 11.30, I was in a bar and closed it. Mm. And I'd go home and didn't want to go. To, well, I was afraid to go to sleep, thinking, oh, this, I lived in an apartment by myself. And I thought, oh, just, I could die here. No one even missed me. But it wouldn't know I'm dead. So yeah. I just flipped around the TV yeah. and come across Swaggart one night. Well, while I was drunk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A lot of people go through that. A lot of people, they're not Christian. They're, they're, you know, and they'll flip channels and something, they'll pass a channel, Christian station, the minister says something that just catches their ear and they sit and watch. Well, that's what I always tell people. The next week, I told Connie, we were, we were dating, but she worked a regular day job. And when I get out home from the bars, I'd be calling her, talking to her at two or three o'clock in the morning. And she she found Jesus a long time before I did. So, and, uh, yeah. so the next the next week I said, "Well, I got to go home sober. I want to watch this guy mm -hmm. and listen to what he said when I'm sober. Make sure I understood what he said." Mm -hmm. and of course, tell people I didn't know he was on every night. I could have watched. It. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess we can close in prayer now. Dear Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your being in all our lives, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing in the churches. I thank you for what you're doing in the country, revival in the youth and the colleges, Lord. 
Roe versus Wade, Wade turned over, the, the different things for your glory, Lord. We ask you to, to spread that fire on the youth in this country, to awaken them across the campuses, across this country. Lord, to save them, to bring them forth. Lord, I ask you to be with us, to guide us and use us, watch over us. And I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord, that you would watch over your people there, protect them, give them wisdom, words of knowledge, protect them, and let them know what the enemy is up to so that it won't affect them or that they can do things to protect themselves. You know, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I just want to pray for Bishop.